Shabdar Shivashami again and uh, today in our fourth lecture we are going to discuss more on model evaluation. So there are two things that we are going to cover. First is how to evaluate a regression model and secondly uh, how or what is a critical issue in classifiers or any models per se which is overfitting. So these are the two things that we'll discuss. So now first evaluating regression models. So regression models are typically uh, evaluated using a measure called as mean square error. Okay, so let's look at the term very closely. So yi is the actual output or actual uh, dependent variable. Okay, so in this case, if you look at uh, the uh, chart, so here year of education is the independent variable and income is the dependent variable. Okay, and f bar xi is what you are predicting based on your model all right so yi minus f bar xi is called as the error okay and as you take a square of the same then that's why you called as squared error and finally you are taking a mean of it so that's why you call this term as a mean square error okay now if you look at this line uh, so this projections from this red circle, so the red circles or the red points are the actual points and this blue line or blue card is your model, okay. So essentially this, this projections are the errors, alright. So what you want is you want the errors to be minimized. So that's why you are using this mean square error. Why you are taking a square? Because some places the line is underestimating it and some places it is overestimating. So if you don't square, they will cancel each other out. The next question is why you are not taking absolute value? So if I take absolute value, then only it will not, it will not cancel out. The reason is when you take absolute value, that doesn't extend itself so nicely to taking off derivatives. So finding off you know, coefficients becomes difficult. Okay. So now I bring you to the second topic, which is overfitting. All right. So let us look at this example. First, let me set the context. So this is a data where you have two independent variables. Each, each row actually represents a student. All right. So you, you have their scores in maths and English. And basically, uh, they are either being successful in placement interviews or they are not getting successful in placement interviews. So the ones that are marked in uh, blue are the ones who are getting successful and the one uh, who are not getting successful are marked in red. So there are two classes, like the example we have seen in case of dark. So it is dark or not dark, placed or not placed. And basically, if you think very simplistically, building a classifier is nothing but drawing a line such that one side of the line, there are these red points and another side, there is this blue points. Okay. So this is what you want to build or you want to happen. So now uh, there are two classifiers that are in business over here. One is this classifier uh, one, which is marked in this green color. And another is classifier 2, which is marked in this black color. So both of these classifiers are actually trying to draw a line which differentiates blue from the red. So here, a question to you is, which classifier do you think is better? Is it classifier 1 or is it classifier 2? So many of the times, some of my students tell that, sir, of course, the green classifier or the classifier one is better because it has minimum error. Now the problem with such a classifier is that, you know, it tries to memorize the data. So if some students are added randomly, this classifier will change drastically or some students are taken away, this classifier will change randomly. Okay, so basically this classifier is showing a tendency to mug up, to memorize, okay? So this tendency of the models is called as overfitting. So uh, I am sure that, you know, you, you have seen this tendency in people. 
So let's say you are teaching a student who has a tendency to mug up. And it's a maths, uh, uh, you know, maths paper for which you are giving your training. So naturally the sample problem, if you want to test his understanding, naturally you will hold away a set of problems, okay, uh, on which you will test his understanding. All right, you will, you will make him do some sample problems with you, but you will not test his understanding on the same set of sample problems, right? So it turns out, so that is what you do even here. So what you do is you take the entire set of data and break them up into training set and testing set. The training set is where you make him learn and testing set is where you test his understanding, how he is able to learn the concept, okay, how he is able to generalize because if he has memorized, then uh, he cannot, you know, solve all the problems from testing set. So now my question is that how do I, you know, split into training and testing set? What is an essential characteristic? So the first essential characteristic is that uh, the nature of the training set and the nature of the testing set should be similar or as close as possible. And you can very well understand because if I train a student on algebra and give him questions from trigonometry, he cannot work on that or he, he cannot be uh, doing good. So how can I do that? So here the very simple process of random sampling comes into rescue. So basically uh, in random sampling all rows has equal probability of getting selected. Okay. So you basically take a random sample from your entire data set, you put that as trained and whatever is remaining you put that in test. So that's how you work. But here, a question to ponder is that if there are multiple students, they will have separate training set and testing set because it's a random sample, right? So now what will happen is that uh, the model that I build on sample one and the model that I build on sample two will be different, will be a little bit different, okay? So uh, let us try to compare models from this perspective. So, we, okay. So, here is a scenario where we have two models, M1 and M2, and there are three samples, S1, S2, and S3. For sake of simplicity, we are assuming that the testing set has only one record, which has actual value of 5. So, when I build uh, M1 on S1, I get a prediction of 4.5. When we train on S2, I get a value of 5. When I get trained on S3, I get a value of 5.5. And when I am doing that same thing for M2, I get a predict prediction of 4.3, 4.8, and 5.3 respectively. Now, a question is, which model do you think is better? Is it M1 or M2? So most of you intuitively will tell me that, sir, model M1 will, is better. And the reason is that, you know, the average value of the predictions is closer to the actual value. So in this case, the average of 4.5 and 5.5 is 5. And the second case, the average of 4.3, 4.8 and 5.3 is 4.8. So from that perspective, you will say that model 1 is better. Okay, now let's look from another perspective. Here are two further sets, M1 and M3, similarly being trained on S1, S2 and S3. So here if you see the actual value is 4.5, 5 and 5.5 for M1 and 4, 5 and 6 for M3. Now tell me which model is better. Is it M1 or is it M3? So again, most of you will tell that model M1 is better because it has a less variation from the actual value. So it turns out that these two components we call as bias and variance respectively, okay? So bias refers uh, to the deviation from the average value of predictions from the actual value, that is bias, and variance is the variability between the predictions. So bias is the difference between average of the predictions and actual, variance is variability of the predictions, okay? So these are the two components that are part of the error, okay? 
So here is a pictorial representation of bias and variance. And I think you have already understood that the goal is to build a low bias and low variance system. Okay. So if you look at this particular example, this red circle actually represents the actual value. And this blue dots represents the different predictions that are done on different samples. Okay. So in the first case, you can see that uh, they are quite close. So variability is less and they are quite close to actual also. So the bias is also less. This model, you will see that uh, it is quite close to the uh, actual, but it is quite spread out, right? So the bias is less, but the variance is high. In this particular model, you will see that the actuals are far from uh, the output and uh, the variability is less. So this is low variance, high bias. And the finally, you have high variance, high bias. Okay. Now let us uh, take to another look. Uh, that it turns out again that when we want to do a trade-off between or we want to minimize bias and variance, there is a trade-off. And let us try to understand this. So basically, uh, you know, uh, model complexity is one of the parameters. What is com model complexity? Again, very simplistically, uh, model complexity varies with number of parameters the model takes. As the number of parameters goes up, the complexity goes now let us understand if you have more parameters these are like more levers that you have got to go closer to the actual so if the model is complex what do you think will the bias be more or less as you have more controls you can go closer to the actual so that's what happens you know as the model complexity goes up this bias goes up okay and as each model is represented by parameters. So as there are more parameters, the variance between the models are more. So that's why the variability between the predictions will also be more. So that's the reason as the model complexity goes up, the variance also goes up. To bring the variance and bias in same time, the bias is squared and they are summed up. So this gives you total error. Basically, what you want is you want to find an optimal model which has minimum such error. Okay, so this is about bias and variance trade-off. All right, in our next class, we'll see how to evaluate a clustering-based model. Thank you so much for watching. Give your likes, comments, and questions, and I look forward to see you in my next video.